Hello again, Shadowbuggers. I am Blunty, and welcome to another fully framed episode of DigiDirect TV. Alrighty, gang, a bit of a special episode for you guys this week. This entire episode was recorded in store at the King Street DigiDirect store because there was a special presentation night going on for the launch. Well, not really launch because they're not quite available yet, but, but launch lead up to event thing. <laughs> from Sony about their new Alpha A7 and A7R cameras. And there are two sort of parts of this presentation. The first one is very, very interesting from a very talented photographer who has gone from using DSLRs to, to playing with the NEX line and then along actually using out there in the world playing with the new A7 and A7R. So we get some terrific insight of what they like to actually use in the world and what the benefits are for them for you know real photographers out there the second part of the presentation is from sony themselves and they'll lead us through a lot of the sort of tech specs and what the benefits are and why the benefits are and why they've made particular choices about the hardware and why it's all good news for you and why you should go out and buy one straight away of course they would say that because they're sony but i'm saying that too i think i will be doing a full review on these cameras of course i will as soon as i'm able to get them in my hands i'm chasing up you know, every angle I possibly can and harassing Sony constantly. When can I have one? When can I have one? When can I have one? I want to go shoot one. When can I have one to go out and shoot with? And I'm just sort of waiting for the units to become available. Apparently, there's only like four in Australia at the moment anyway. But you shouldn't have to wait too much longer to get an actual real review unit and get out there in the world. But in the meantime, this should uh, help satisfy your craving for as much information as possible about these amazing, power-packing, almost pocket-sized cameras uh, that have got everyone in the photography world in a tizzy because someone's finally done it. A full frame, mirrorless, interchangeable lens camera. Ah! What's not to, what's not to be excited about? But anyway, enough rambling. It's time for me to step away from the front of the camera to behind the camera and let someone else waffle on at you for a while. So look, thank you everyone for taking the time to head down here and join us tonight. Uh, we're launching two very exciting cameras, the A7, the A7R. Um, my name's Sean, I'm a product specialist at Sony. I'll be telling you guys a bit about the technical properties of these cameras later on. But uh, before I bore you all to death, uh, we've actually got a uh, very exciting keynote speaker tonight. Uh, Mark Gaylor is one of our uh, photography ambassadors. Uh, he hails from Melbourne. He's a uh, senior lecturer at RMIT. He heads up their photography program. Uh, and he's going to be talking a bit about uh, his experiences with the A7 and uh, rather the A7R uh, and uh, lightweight photography. So I'm going to hand over to Mark. Thank you. Oh yeah, sweet little over. <laughs> okay, so um, I got the good fortune to use the camera for about three days, and I wanted to give you sort of my perspective on why I think this is sort of a, a significant camera. I would call it even a landmark camera. Every once in a while a camera comes along, maybe like a Canon 5D Mark II, uh, which sends a benchmark for other uh, camera manufacturers to um, realize that they've got something to uh, move ground on, uh, catch up mode. Okay, this is it. This is one of the shots that I shot. I actually got, uh, good timing actually. I went from uh, Melbourne, um, obviously in the rain, uh, up to uh, O'Reilly's Rainforest Retreat. Um, at the back of the Gold Coast and uh, I managed to uh, put the camera through its uh, paces there. Okay, I was using um, uh, uh, one of the new 55mm uh, which will be released next year, the Carl Zeiss and uh, I was also using my Alpha lenses. That, um, I made a switch from Nikon uh, to, um, uh, to Sony uh, some time ago and so I just wanted to run through some of the things that uh, why I think this is important. Uh, just a little bit about me, uh, as Sean pointed out, I'm a lecturer at RMIT uh, University. Uh, I'm also a popular author. Uh, I had a new book come out uh, this week, okay, which you can get from Amazon if you so wished. Um, this is uh, me um, traveling light uh, back in the 1980s. This is where I learned to appreciate um, how to travel light and why we needed to travel light occasionally. Uh, this is me actually riding to Australia from the UK. It was a charity ride. It took me quite a while, especially as it took me about two hours to dig myself out of this salt lake because I wasn't light enough. And uh, as you can see, the salt lake uh, has stuck to my rear wheel there. Uh, one of these panniers is filled with uh, camera gear, um, uh, Nikon bodies, of which I have one 
here. This is one of the bodies that I carried around. And as you can see, some people will say this is a small camera, but actually, it's actually the same size as the cameras I used to use in the 1980s. Okay, it's, I think uh, cameras uh, put on a little bit of a middle age spread uh, without us actually noticing they were getting heavier. So this is a, a welcome return. The first time I actually held this camera, it felt strangely familiar to me. Uh, these always fit comfortably in my hand. This actually fit, um, fits even more comfortably because it's got a much better grip than the uh, old Nikons. It doesn't matter whether you're using the ca um, Canon AE1s, uh, FMs, FGs, uh, all about the same size, OM1s even slightly smaller. Okay, so uh, I made a, I was a very early uh, convert to digital. I was using the very first digital SLR uh, made by Kodak and shoehorned into a Nikon body. One and a half megapixels, $30,000. People said I was absolutely mad. Uh, people thought that when I came to Australia and, and I kept on saying I've seen the future, um, they, it's just as well I wasn't actually certified. <laughs> Um, one of the things I came to love about full frame when I went from crop sensors to full frame was the amount of forgiveness that um, we have when shooting in full frame. A lot of people shoot on their mobile phones these days and they say, well, that's good enough for me. But in a mobile phone, you'll get that and that's what you'll have to play with and that's all you'll get. But uh, with a big dynamic range of a full frame sensor, you can do that. That is actually the same image. Because it, is, because it is information rich. Uh, the information is there in the highlights and shadows and we can open the shadows up, close the highlights down and on a full frame sensor it's very forgiving. We open up the shadows and noise and banding is held within acceptable levels and this looks good on a 4K screen or even on a double page spread. So that's really what I uh, came to love. Remember when I was shooting film in the 1980s, Kodachrome 64 uh, was the film of choice of the magazine editors. Uh, this is actually a mistake. This is a, a grab shot. I'm actually a stop, stop and a half under by accident here. Okay, and uh, also the ISO has been raised to 800. This is actually on a, a, a full frame Nikon sensor. The sensor, sensors that arrived in the D3 Nikon and the D700 was a classic sensor albeit only um, 12 megapixels, it allowed us, again, to do this remarkable stuff, okay? I stopped bracketing when I um, came into full frame because I realized I could miss the exposure or I could bring in um, stops of highlights and open up the shadows and the full frame would forgive me for my sins. Okay, so this is a, a lyrebird that I shot in the Dandenongs. 6400 ISO on a Nikon um, uh, uh, 7200 lens, just stop down one stop, just pulling the um, required handheld shutter speed of a 200th per second, 6400 ISO, and you know, going back to old film days, you've got a grain structure of you know, 200 ISO film, you know, simply amazing. If people said that they could add a couple of zeros onto my Kodachrome and I'd still be doing double page spreads. Again, I would have thought they were bonkers. Okay, so, so one would think that I'd be happy and I'd still be using my Nikon D700. But there was a couple of problems with my Nikon D700. And that is, it didn't shoot video and it was only 12 megapixels. So basically I had to frame in camera uh, to allow uh, picture editors to go double page spread if necessary. Okay, so as I was looking around, Obviously a, ca um, a camera, a full frame sensor with 24 megapixels and uh, class leading video uh, was obviously very appealing to me. Okay, so um, this is at 12,800 ISO. This was when I was uh, um, given the A99, which sold me on the A99 actually. Uh, as I was moving around Melbourne late at night shooting these images, I realized um, as I raised the camera to my eye, I was seeing things that I couldn't actually see with my own human vision. Like there's a guy sitting on a bench down here that I only noticed as I put the camera to my eye. Because one of the differences obviously coming from an optical viewfinder to an electronic viewfinder was, you know, all of the differences we, we um, um, 
we come to expect, you know, live histograms, uh, previews, live previews of what we're about to capture, but also the EVF gaining up in low light. And I was actually sold on the EVF. If you've only ever used EVFs on crop sensors, then using an EVF on a full frame sensor, again, is, is a great experience. Okay, much cleaner signal coming from a much bigger sensor. Okay, uh, one of the things I wasn't expecting, because I've never really been a sports photographer, was the ability to do uh, full-time phase detection autofocus. This is a, a girl and her dog that was uh, coming towards me, tracking at a, an angle. I locked on with the, um, the focus lock and then did a burst of like 15 shots. And when I was going through them in post-production, I was looking for the ones that were sharp. And the surprising thing was, is they were all sharp. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I'm no sports photographer, but that was uh, amazing for me to experience that. Okay, so the other thing that was a little bit surprising was not only it was 1080p, but it's also at 50 frames per second. So if you want to play it back at uh, 24 or 25 frames per second, you get um, jitter-free, smooth, flowing, slow motion video. You don't have to have it, but it's an option. Okay, so that is great. A lot of the other camera manufacturers, if you want faster frame rates, you have to go down to 720, or you have to go down to a crop sensor. So again, um, Sony sort of uh, have a, a, a niche market in this area. Okay, this is really um, what was uh, of my primary interest, is I'm actually with a 70 to 400 lens, and I'm as close as Melbourne Zoo will let me uh, get to uh, Sanook, the baby elephant, on a naming day. And uh, really, the magazine shot is not this bit, unless they want to put the text over the left hand side page what they actually want is more likely that which allows me to throw away 12 megapixels and still have enough pixels uh, for my editorial work okay that was also like 5000 ISO perfectly usable uh, imagery okay okay so am I happy with my A99 alpha lenses well it was a big step up from my D700 but um, this, uh, all of that performance has um, a drawback, and that's why we're here tonight, because that drawback was always weight. Okay. And so here is my um, um, backpack, okay, uh, with, um, it's a very light backpack. It's, um, you know, I've seen a couple of carry-on pieces of luggage, which are three and a half kilos empty. If you fly in version, that only leaves you three and a half to put in the bag. Okay, this, is, uh, this bag is probably only a kilo, and uh, by the time I've packed it up with a couple of lenses, a flash, hard drive, and my laptop, it's weighing in at 11 kilos, which is four kilos overweight for Virgin and one kilo overweight for Qantas. And, I, and I'm, I'm packed light. I, at uh, the O'Reilly's that we went to, one of the guys was walking around with 16 kilos or 17 kilos on his back. And he'd taken that through check-in, okay? And he must have worked up a bit of a sweat going through check-in because that's like getting a speeding fine if they make you weigh your luggage, which they often do when on full flights these days. Okay, so until... Okay, you thought I was coming in with the A7, didn't you? But we're <laughs> making you wait here. The RX-1 was big news for me. But it wouldn't really fit what I needed it to do. I needed that full focal range going from 16 mil out to two, three, four hundred mil. And so this is this was a great camera for street shooters uh, to go out there who typically love a 35 mil focal length. Fabulous lens in a very lightweight, and uh, this will still have a huge market for those photographers. Okay, interesting thing about this camera is you were not trading anything by that small package. We had 14.3 stops dynamic range on there. To give you a clue of how big that is, Kodachrome was five. Okay. <clears throat> if you have a look at, uh, this is an independent company, DxO, testing the performance of this sensor. Okay, you've got a D800E heading up the pack with a D800 and a, a Sony Cybershot DSRX1 coming in at number three. By the way, all of those are Sony sensors. Okay, and number four comes in as a medium format phase one IQ 180. 
Okay, that's a $45,000 camera built for dynamic range, being outperformed by a pocket camera. Yeah. <laughs> Pause for thought. If you've got any shares in uh, Hasselblad or Phase One, now might be a good time to uh, sell them. Okay, high ISO performance again, right up there with the pack. Okay, we're all well, this is full frame territory, obviously, but this is right at the top of the full frame territory. Okay, so this is uh, really what we're looking at today is we're looking at these big sensors and we absolutely um, can put our rest assured that they're actually going to perform uh, with the best. Okay. Okay, so along came, comes the A7 and the A7R. Okay, 100% full frame <coughs> forgiveness. Okay, but less weight. And this is the camera pretty much I've been waiting for, for a very long time. Okay, let's have a look at uh, the camera. Uh, Sean will go through the tech specs in a short while. Okay, if I start going into the tech specs, I'll probably make a mistake. I'm more interested in how the camera feels in the hand and the images that come out the other end. Okay. And, uh, okay, this is an interesting, uh, if you want to go home and check your camera alongside one of these, um, uh, uh, A7, A7Rs, you can go to camerasize.com you can pick any camera and then compare it to any other camera um, obviously the camera we, we most likely you know, want to compare it to because it carries a very similar sensor is a D800E and we can see the size of it there side by side top view side view, whichever way you look at it it's half the dimensions and pretty much less than half the weight of that D800. And there it is alongside an OMD. Again, people see this as a, as a sort of a classic uh, style camera. Uh, lots of manual controls, everything uh, is at hand. But look at it, it's, it's pretty much spot on the same size as the A7 and A7R. The huge difference of course is that sensor is like 3.8 times more surface area than the OMD and as I've showed you with some of those images that full frame forgiveness you're not going to get from a four-third sensor okay okay so let's do the mass this this mass is uh, not the dry mass you're not going to uh, look at too much uh, mass except the important uh, mass is can I get this system <coughs> down below seven kilos without leaving any gear back home these lenses are going to be released next year. At the moment, we can basically uh, bring anything, any lenses that we've got, and there will be an adapter to put them onto the A7. So while we're waiting for the lens uh, lineup to build, we're basically going to use all of the lenses that we currently own. Okay, but these lenses are going to come out. Zeiss and the G are obviously the premium brands for to put on size, uh, um, Sony cameras. We're looking at 426 grams for the 2470 and 840 grams for the 70 to 200. Now I'm not too sure whether you're familiar with weight, but they're coming in at half the weight of my alpha lenses for the A99. And so if we look at the camera spec, 465 grams, those two lenses, we're, we're looking at a uh, um, camera and two lenses, 1.73 kilos, okay? You put in the bag and the accessories, the leads, the spare batteries, the filters, that sort of stuff. You're looking at another t two kilos if you choose your bag, bag carefully. I've got a ProMaster 525. I bought this when I started using NEX cameras because I didn't need my three kilo Manfrotto. This comes in at 1.2 kilos with a ball head, a Manfrotto ball head. Okay. And then you've got a MacBook Pro Retina at two kilograms. You could actually uh, get a, a MacBook Air for 1.3 kilos and you come in at 6.95. Not only does that come in under the Virgin carry-on, but I've also got a tripod, which I didn't actually have in the 11 kilo setup I showed you earlier. So I'm significantly coming in underweight, so much so that I could even change underwear, you know, put a change of underwear in the bag, lest my check-in baggage goes astray in um, uh, downtown, you know, Koala Lumpur which is the last place I last, uh, lost three kilos. Uh, last time I was flying, I was flying Emirates, 10 kilos. 
but I had a side flight to Penang, seven kilos, so I checked three because they were weighing, and that was the last time I saw that three kilos, thousand dollars a kilo. Oh. I was insured, but then I didn't have three kilos of technology for a shoot. Okay, so these are the shots. Okay, I only had the camera for a long weekend. So this is me at uh, Tullamarine Airport uh, doing that street style <coughs> photography. We've got a nice flip screen so you can put the camera down by your waist, frame something up, pretend you're fiddling with the camera, uh, roll off a few frames. If they look up, you just fiddle with the camera some more. And uh, I've got, I don't know whether you can see, um, but he's, uh, he's obviously got his, uh, must be an exciting news story in the age that day. And uh, we've got full detail through white jets parked outside on the bitumen, and also in the black wheelie bins. You won't pick up the detail on the TV, but it's there. Um, notice some uh, movement out of the corner of my eye. I can, I can fire off quickly. Absolutely no problem with quick focusing and um, a response with these cameras. And uh, we've got, uh, we can go in close and get some detail. This is a 36 megapixel sensor, of course. So actually, you've probably got enough in that little crop to, um, to go half a page in a magazine. So uh, even if you've not got some super long lenses with a 36 megapixel sensor, you'll just crop two sides. Okay, we're at uh, Coolangatta Airport now, waiting for my pickup to O'Reilly's. And there we are up at O'Reilly's Rainforest Retreat. Okay, and um, okay, what you'd expect is things that are not moving, you know, it'll focus on really quite um, quick. But then when you're in, um, in the forest, uh, low light conditions, I'm really pushing the ISO now. Okay, and a lot of these shots that you're about to see are going to be um, at ISO over 3,200 sometimes 4,000, 5,000, 6,400, okay, and as you would expect, uh, they're sharp, they're detail, information rich images, lots of shadow detail, lots of highlight detail. I was actually using an LEA4 adapter, Sean will talk about the adapters, with a 70 to 400 um, alpha lens, and uh, this allows full-time phase detection autofocus, even on the A7R, you can get that sports performance that we were looking at earlier. Okay. Obviously full frame sensors giving that nice um, out of focus uh, backgrounds when shooting wide. Obviously you're shooting wide to build up the shutter speed for this wildlife as they dart around in the bush. Okay, a little bit of uh, we're going into the deep forest now, so there's an uh, on-camera flash going. And uh, obviously we've got that uh, high dynamic range performance, so um, again, one of the hardest things to photograph is uh, sunshine coming through rainforest. Obviously, deep, deep shadows, bright, bright highlights. Mm -hmm. But again, um, just take it into uh, Adobe Camera Raw, pull down the highlights, open up the shadows, and your, your shots will be information rich. A nice little gecko coming in really close. I love my 70 to 400. You can get in really close, uh, the 70 end. Uh, it almost operates like a, a macro lens. That lizard ain't too big. But I'm getting in real close with that lens on that one. Looks like he's smiling there. <laughs> And uh, we picked him up, put him on a rock, and then watch him, um, watch him camouflage himself on the new surface over the next five minutes. Okay, so this is going to be important for a, not just professionals like myself who are going out um, and doing um, uh, jobs interstate <coughs> and overseas occasionally, but also there's a growing number of um, amateur photographers who do want to get engaged in travel and photographic travel and uh, I'm going to take a group up to Machu Picchu and obviously there's going to be walking involved and I know how much weight I want on my back to be honest you'll probably see some side um, bags down there which you carry on your hip the cameras lend themselves not to putting into a backpack and then apologizing to your family or other uh, mem members who are walking with you every time you put your pack down you access a different lens put the pack back on walk on if you're accessing it all through a, um, a hip bag or a waist bag, 
then obviously this style of photography and these style of cameras are really going to come into their own for a very large sector. Okay, this is going to be a huge growth area, I reckon, um, for uh, this style of photography. No compromise. Okay, so what I'm saying is uh, for people who want to make n absolutely no compromise in quality but really want to travel with half the weight. Okay, so there's my corny little catchphrase for those who want their cake without the weight. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Excuse my dust. Um, all right, thank you very much, Mark. I think it's. Um, so look, what I want to do is sort of fill you in on a few of the, I guess, technical aspects of the camera. Of course, I imagine you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't already know a little something about these cameras. Um, but I want to sort of open up a few areas that, uh, you know, maybe I can shed a bit of interesting light on or, or things that aren't always immediately apparent on picking up the camera. So uh, I have a bunch of photos here, but actually next to all of Mark's nice photos, I feel they're probably worth skipping over. Um, so we have two really, of course, exciting cameras here tonight. The A7, 24 megapixels, 5 frames per second, phase detect autofocus. And uh, the A7R, 36 megapixels, no optical low-pass filter, uh, really the, the PS2 is a chance. <coughs> and I wanted to talk about a few different things tonight. Of course, I want to put these cameras in perspective because I think, uh, you know, it's a great, it's, it's a incredible innovation to put that huge sensor into such a tiny camera but uh, it's great to see it really in context and I think Mark's actually already touched on this but I will touch on it one more time. The new processor, uh, the image quality that you can get out of these cameras is really uh, staggering and I want to talk a little bit about the technology that underlies that image quality. Uh, the handling on these cameras, some of the little touches that we've added in uh, which uh, you know there's a lot going on in that interface and it's great to sort of pick out a few interesting bits and pieces. Uh, the autofocus on this camera, uh, you know, I think coming from DSLR to a compact uh, mirrorless system, autofocus performance is always a concern, uh, and we've really worked very hard to make the autofocus as good as it can be. Uh, and then just a couple of points of comparison between the A7 and A7R, and then I'll just quickly talk about some accessories. So, as Mark has eloquently described, good things now come in very small packages, and it's interesting to sort of look at the A7R in comparison to some existing cameras. The A99 uh, was our uh, most recent full-frame camera. That is, uh, well, full-frame interchangeable lens camera, I should say. When that came out, it was the lightest full-frame camera with autofocus, and it was 812 grams, almost twice the 465 grams of the A7R. Looking next to a 5D Mark III, now we're at 895 grams very nearly twice. The D800, a kilo, more than double the weight of an A64, uh, sorry, of an A7. And, uh, and finally, next to the OMD EM1, we have a camera which uh, is lighter than the EM1, but has a sensor which is 3.8 times the surface area. Um, pretty staggering, uh, just a, an incredible feat of engineering, really. Now that big sensor is, is exciting, of course, because of the picture quality it gives us. Um, and one of the things that really enhances the picture quality, especially on the A7R, is this new uh, micro lens design. So, uh, you know, you, you normally think going from a 24 megapixel, like the A7, up to a 36 megapixel camera, like the A7R, you're going to have a big hit to your high ISO performance because each individual pixel, pixel is that much smaller. What we've done is improve the micro lenses on the sensor so that they uh, can catch more light, they can make more efficient use of the light that does reach the sensor, and so the ISO performance of the uh, A7R is actually very similar to that of the A7. Probably still a small edge to the A7, but it's, it's extremely close. Another thing that's been done with the micro lenses on the A7R is the corners have offset micro lenses. Uh, if you follow the sort of scene of a adapting third-party rangefinder lenses onto uh, mirrorless cameras, you'll know one of the real issues is always shading in the corners, you get false colour casts in the corners, um, it's, it can be a real pain. Uh, by offsetting the micro lenses, we can offset that issue. Uh, we essentially can catch that light much more effectively, uh, so we get less corner shading, we get better sharpness, and we get, get less false colour. So. Uh, the A7R is not only, uh, 
you know, the, the real top of the top for picture quality on conventional lenses, but also if you're adapting rangefinder lenses, it's, it's an outstanding option. So what does that actually mean in the real world? I uh, found this sample. Um, some of you who uh, frequent the uh, nerdier corners of the internet might be familiar with it. This is a, uh, a photograph by a fellow called uh, Gustav Kiberg, who uh, frequents the Dixon forums. Uh, so this is a photograph from the A7R, taken with the 35mm f2.8 lens. And uh, this is the photograph that it was cropped from. So as you can see, the detail you can achieve on that 36 megapixel sensor, and not only the sensor, but also the lens. Uh, the combination, of course, is the vital thing, and uh, the detail and the dynamic range is, is pretty astounding. Now, of course, the sensor is vitally important, but the processor that deals with all the information that comes off that sensor is, is really equally important to getting a great picture in the end. Uh, and that's why we have our new Beyonds X processor. So the Beyonds X processor is a, you know, we, we, we create new processors with every camera that we bring out, but we don't usually change the name. So uh, by, by calling this one Beyonds X, we're really denoting that this is a big step forward. It's four times faster than the previous processor. And what that means is we're able to do uh, a lot of clever things in terms of processing, and also, as I'll touch on later, on, with autofocus. So the first thing, of course, we all want better shots at high ISO. And one of the things that we do is uh, subject-aware noise reduction. So uh, when we have a very detailed subject, we soft-pedal the noise reduction. So we don't want to destroy good image detail. We want to retain good detail. So you can see here in the keys, we still have really good resolution of all the details. But we've taken out a lot of that chroma noise, a lot of that color noise that's appearing uh, in the other uh, unnamed competitors camera all those um, <laughs> the other competitor that has a 36 megapixel sensor uh, so here though in a uh, area of smooth blur you can see that uh, we have a more aggressive form of noise reduction so you know in blue skies you're going to really notice that noise you want it really just <coughs> tamped down completely so here we can see no distracting colour noise, it's, it's very, very smooth and clear. Now another area where we've done a lot of work is just on the general image processing engine, uh, what we call uh, detail reproduction technology, improved sharpening, uh, and, and sharpening is something that's applied to every JPEG image that comes out of your camera. Uh, we have a new engine which means that we get better detail and also less artifacts. So ordinarily when you conduct sharpening, you get things like halos, you get artifacts of, of that sharpening process. Uh, with the new Beyond's X processor, we can be much more uh, subtle with the way that we do the sharpening, and so we get a lot less of that artifacting. Now, having that great image quality is fantastic, but it would be nice to have that great image quality for a long time to come. So these uh, A7 cameras are built to last. Uh, you know, I think especially with the first generation products, uh, there's always a, a tendency to be a little uh, leery. Uh, but these cameras, of course, come from a very long lineage of Sony interchangeable lens cameras. We've been working on this technology for a long time, uh, and a lot of care has been taken to make sure that these things perform really well out of the gate. Part of that is weather sealing, and this is something we've applied to the entire system. So uh, every uh, A7, A7R, every FE lens that goes to them, uh, the grip uh, and the flashes that are available for these cameras are all weather sealed. So uh, whatever you're using within this system, uh, you know you can take it wherever you go, uh, and in all likelihood you'll chicken out before it does. Uh, the, uh, these things are completely fine to shoot in the rain. Now, in terms of construction, we've built these things to take a licking and keep on ticking, as they say. Uh, they use a lot of magnesium alloy in the construction uh, in both models, a little more in the A7R than in the A7. Uh, but these things are lightweight, they're tough, uh, and uh, they'll continue to function well for many years to come. The interface is obviously vitally important for a camera like this, and uh, we've done a lot of work to make sure that these cameras fall well to hand. Uh, we've taken a lot of lessons from both the uh, A-mount and uh, 
in-out cameras that we've made in the past, and even some of the Cybershop cameras uh, that we've produced. So you'll notice the exposure dial on these cameras uh, has never appeared on a, uh, a previous Alpha camera, uh, but we've taken it from our RX series cameras uh, because that is such a great way to work with the camera. No memory card. Um, so, you can see here, of course, we've got a few different options uh, for interface, but one of them is our quick Navi interface. Um, anyone who's used one of our A-mount cameras in the past will be familiar with this. One of the great things about this is you can press the function button and just dive into this display and very quickly change any of the settings you want to change uh, without really needing to dive through any menus. Everything's very intuitively laid out. Uh, so you can go to one of these, just start turning a dial very quickly, say, no, I'll change my DRO to auto. Uh, I'm going to set that back to standard because I find the nighttime one a little intense. Um, so all these things are very easy to change uh, on the fly. We also have our uh, our function menu. So this is uh, a menu that's designed to uh, give you quick access to sort of key functions which might not be necessarily assigned to a button. And this is completely customizable. So uh, if I dive into the menus, I can hop over and uh, quickly reassign, for example, let's say here I'd like to be able to adjust my audio levels when I'm recording, and as you can see there's an awful lot of things I can assign in there. Um, so now when I have my camera in movie mode, oh god, that was a terrible mistake. Day. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine it, that if I did, uh, I could jump in here and adjust my audio levels, uh, my audio level display um, very, very easily. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of things that we've put into the interface to improve the user experience. I'm just going to switch back over to my presentation. Okay, so, user interface, uh, but also customization. You know, uh, everyone uses their camera in a different way. Uh, some people love using, you know, different modes. Uh, some of us are really concerned with metering, others will be, you know, always want to adjust our focus area, stuff like that. We have nine different buttons which you can customise on the A7 and the A7R, and you can assign 46 different functions uh, to each of them. So, you can really, once you have this camera set up, uh, never dive into the menu again. You, you pretty much will never have to press that menu button unless you want to format a memory card or something. The grip, of course, on this camera has had a lot of time and effort put into it, and we also have our uh, battery grip accessory. So if you are uh, blessed with exceptionally large hands, uh, even you will find comfortable purchase on this camera uh, with the addition of a battery grip. Now, the viewfinder on this camera, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, I think a lot of us have memories of electronic viewfinders as being kind of uh, nasty, sort of low-res things that we used on our camcorder in 1998. Uh, things have changed. Uh, on the A7 we have an OLED panel, it has 2.4 million dots, it has all new optics and, and that's why this uh, lump on the top of the camera is not just for the sheer retro thrill of it, uh, it really is packed with optics which make a big difference to how that viewfinder looks. So if you haven't already, make sure you take a look through one of these cameras uh, before you go. Now autofocus is really important for every camera that has it and uh, Something that we've really worked on is improving the autofocus speed on both the A7 and the A7R. So, compared to our NEX cameras, they have faster autofocus, and that's despite having a full frame sensor which has inherently shallower depth of field. Where we've really made the improvement is with the processor. So, as I said earlier, four times faster. When we shoot uh, with a contrast detected autofocus system, we need to drive the lens, we need to read the image, and then we need to process that information to get our lens moving again. In the past, that processing of the information has been a bottleneck. So by having a faster processor, we can do that processing four times faster, and that means our whole cycle performs faster, we can lock focus faster, and we can get on with the business of shooting. IAF is a really fantastic function that I love to demo, so I will. Um, this is something that uh, we've added in on these cameras, and with the shallow depth of field you can achieve on these cameras, it's kind of quite important. Um, so Ordinarily, with, uh, when you're trying to do a portrait, you want to nail focus on the eye. Um, and that can be kind of tricky, right? If you're using wide area autofocus, often you nail the nose, you get the ear, um, and then the eyes are all blurry, it's not so good. With IAF, when you press the IAF button, it looks for the eye of your subject and confirms that you've got focus exactly where you want it. So then, 
when you take the photo, you know you've got uh, exactly the focus you want. And excuse me for my awkward grip here. I'm going to have to you know, I'll put it into PMO. Uh, here we go. Best portrait of the century. Go. <laughs> right, let's have a look. Have I got the focus? Yes, I have. A little bit of motion blur, but you can see those eyelashes are tack sharp. So, let's go back to the presentation. Can we please? Yes. All right, great. So, um, fast hybrid AF. This is a feature that is only on the A7. Um, this is a combination of phase detect and contrast detect autofocus, and it means that the A7 is able to track a moving subject, unlike the A7R, which will lose focus on a, a subject that's moving if you're firing continuously. So, uh, this is a consideration if you are shooting, you know, a lot of kids running around, uh, fast motion, um, and you want to be able to have that, that burst uh, ability. Here you can see uh, we have sort of this central area of the sensor. It has 117 uh, contrast detect, no, that's the wrong one, phase detect autofocus sensors, uh, and those allow the A7 to track a moving subject. Uh, now, quickly, just the uh, sort of a few other differences between the A7 and the A7R. Of course, I've already mentioned uh, phase detect autofocus, and I've mentioned the body construction. Here you can see the difference in the magnesium alloy used in the A7 and the A7R. Um, so on the A7R we have this additional front plate, and that means when we're using uh, heavier lenses, we get a little bit more rigidity, a little bit less flex in the body, so it's a, a bit of a nicer experience. Other than that, of course, uh, the differences in sensor, uh, we also get a slightly different sync speed. So if you do a lot of flash photography, that may be significant for you. Let's quickly talk about accessories and then we can get back to playing with the cameras. Uh, Firstly, the battery grip. I did touch on this uh, briefly earlier. Um, the battery grip is going to accommodate two W series batteries, so same batteries that we use in the cameras, of course. Uh, it also has a nice little spot for your battery door, so uh, if you're like me, the minute you take your battery door off your camera, you will lose it, uh, so make sure you put it into its little home in the battery grip. Now, the nice thing about this battery grip is when you're using two batteries in it, it's going to always deplete completely uh, the emptiest battery. So if you've got one that's half empty, one that's full, it's not going to drain your full one and then you've got you know, two kind of mostly empty batteries. It'll completely empty out the one that's got a bit taken out of it and that way you can pop it out, put it under charge while you keep on shooting with your full battery. Um, so there it is on the camera body. As you can see, adds a fair bit of grip uh, and even in, in landscape orientation you get a little bit more purchase on the bottom there. So uh, it's great, especially of course if you're using larger lenses but even with the native lenses, it'll give you a stack of extra power uh, and a little bit of extra purchase there. Lenses, vitally, vitally important. The only lens you'll be able to buy off a shelf when these ship is the 35mm f2.8 Sonar. Um, bit of an unusual lens design for a 35mm uh, lens, but because we have such a short flange distance, we can do it. Uh, this is a phenomenally sharp lens, as you guys saw earlier, the, the detail out of this lens is, is pretty special. Uh, now, a theme that you'll see across the lenses that we're developing in the FE range, that's our full frame E-mount lenses, is that uh, we're not going for uh, necessarily the most sexy g -whiz aperture. Uh, what we want to do is have uh, extremely good performance, a good solid aperture, uh, and a compact and lightweight design that goes to these cameras. So if you really want to have the fastest aperture you can possibly have, of course, there's a wide range of adaptable lenses. If we made this into a 35mm f1.4, it would no longer be kind of small, lightweight, suitable for this camera. Next up is the 55mm f1.8 Zeiss Sonar. Again, this is not your classic nifty 50. I know it says 50mm f1.8 right there on the slide, but uh, this is not your classic 51.8. Uh, this is an extremely high resolving lens, um, fantastic background defocus. Uh, this is a slight, sort of a slightly long normal, so you can use this of course for a little bit of uh, longer portraiture. Uh, and as you can see there, it still has plenty of background defocusing ability. We also have our 28 to 70 f3.5 to f5.6. This is that lens here. Uh, it's only available in a kit with the A7, so uh, it's not going to be sort of generally available to buy off a shelf. Um, at $200 premium over the A7, it's a bit of a steal. Uh, so if you want something you can pick up and start walking around with immediately that's suited for the body, this is a great choice. 
If on the other hand you want something a little bit more special, you might wait until January when we're releasing our 24-70 f4 Zeiss. Uh, about the same size as the kit lens, but with uh, a constant aperture uh, and a little bit nicer quality. And of course, uh, as you can see here, continuing that uh, theme of having maybe a stop down from a, a conventional DSLR lens, but a compact and of course weather sealed design. So uh, it's a perfect fit for the A7 and A7R. And finally, the adapter. Uh, so the LAEA4 uh, mount adapter, um, which I think is actually elsewhere, which is fine, uh, will allow you to mount your uh, A mount lenses onto your A7. So, uh, of course, sometimes there's no substitute for a nice fast aperture or a long lens, uh, and this will allow you to do that. Not everyone shoots alpha though, and for those people, because we have a relatively limited lens lineup at launch, we want to make it easy for people to use their lenses uh, on these cameras. So if you purchase uh, either the A7 body only, which runs uh, 1999, uh, or the A7R body only, which is 2499, uh, you will actually get a piece of paper in the box which will allow you to redeem a mount adapter of your choice. So if you currently shoot Canon, uh, we'll send you a uh, 35, uh, sorry, a, um, a Metabones uh, Canon adapter. Uh, if you shoot Nikon, we'll send you one for Nikon. If you prefer the Leica M lenses, you're a bit of a rangefinder freak, then we'll send you a Leica M adapter. So uh, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to use the lenses you currently own on your A7 or A7R. So that kind of brings me to uh, prices. I've already told you the price for both the bodies. 1999 for A7. 2499 for this A7R. The A7 kit is 2199, so a $200 premium. The uh, battery grip, which I've misplaced now, here we go, 2999 for the battery grip. Uh, we have the 35mm f2.8 at 999, the 55mm f1.8 at 1199, and the 24 to 70 Zeiss will be uh, 1499. We also have a 70 to 200 f4 slated for next year, but at this stage we don't have. Uh, pricing uh, information on that lens. So, giving you a bit to think about, grab a drink, mull it over. Uh, I and Mark will be around to talk to, and of course the DigiDirect guys are here to help you with any sales related inquiries. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of the night. Cheers guys. Thank you.